Hello and welcome to the SaaS Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Carl Anderson. Today we're here with Julian Elliott, the founder of Covidence.org. Covidence is a not-for-profit SaaS company that helps professional researchers perform research faster. This episode covers Covidence's journey, the challenges and advantages of operating as a not-for-profit, and how Covidence has leveraged its strong mission to connect with its customers and drive word-of-mouth growth. Julian, welcome to the podcast. Great to be with you, Carl. Thanks for being here. Do you want to start with a little rundown of what Covidence is, of how it came about, and what you were doing at the time when you thought, this needs to exist? Yeah, no, sure. So I think, uh, so Covidence is a platform, a SaaS, that's used around the world by researchers who are trying to like make sense of science. Uh, so science now is like a fire hose. Uh, there's kind of ongoing exponential growth in scientific output, and it's very hard to actually know what's happening in science and therefore to use the results of scientific research either to design new research projects or um, you know to use that science in our decision making in society. So Covidence essentially allows people to find and um, praise the quality and extract the data from all the research studies that might be relevant to a particular topic uh, and then compile those data so that they can get a very rigorous understanding of the research in a particular area, or what I say is like a high fidelity signal of the underlying science. Um, so that's, that's a process known as systematic review or sometimes called evidence synthesis or meta-analysis. And these are kind of well-established kind of scientific workflows um, that are really kind of powerful pathways for the way that science influences society. Um, so in terms of kind of founder story and how this all started, um, I, you know, like I think many founders, there's, you know, many, many kind of contributions. But I think for me, probably one of the most um, impactful was when I was working in Cambodia. So this is in early 2000s. I'm a medical doctor. I was working in HIV, working with the Cambodian government to scale up HIV programs. We had quite a lot of funding in a very, very direct way. We knew that the faster and the more effectively we could scale up our programs, we would literally th save thousands of lives. Like there was a very direct relationship. And so of course the question was, well, how do, how do we scale up quickly and how do we make sure this program is as effective as possible? And so of course we wanted to learn from previous work. Um, so to look at the research that would help guide us. And so this was from everything from like really high level national policy decisions right through to really detailed guidance that we were giving doctors and nurses in the field. And as the kind of expat there, I was, you know, helping people to get access to knowledge, evidence, research that could then inform their decisions. Um, <clears throat> I was working with incredibly effective, passionate, hardworking, smart Cambodian team. And it just seemed completely nuts to me the amount of time and effort it took to try and find research to inform their decisions. I spent a lot of my time kind of trying to find research and to make sure we were making the right decisions. But, you know, it just, it was so, such an expensive and inefficient way of trying to connect knowledge to practice. I felt like I was this like copper wire you know, connecting to the, the kind of global universe of research knowledge to this particular program. And, you know, kind of nuts, you know, that classic moment where you think, oh my God, this system is so broken. I, I really need to do something to kind of change this. So before Covidence, there was nothing else like it on the market? Not really, no. There was, you know, a lot of it was just searching various online databases and trying to pull various things together. There's, there's obviously a number of organizations who'd been trying to do things and, you know, we're producing useful information, but it's very difficult for any of those organizations to keep it up to date with the kind of huge flow of science. So the kind of default was the World Health Organization would produce guidelines about once every two years, you know, these like 100 page PDF documents, which were, inc were very useful, there's no question, but they're kind of designed for the world. So it's like, it's like writing in cookbook where you say, take some food and cook because you know it's it's kind of has to be so generic because it's applied to the whole world but also yeah just the flow of new research like it's it's in you know having a document that comes out once every two years it's just not a great way of creating a high fidelity signal you know and then when i came back to australia i realized actually the situation here is just as bad 
and then I've, over time, of course, realised it's the same all around the world. And actually, it's the same in all sectors, you know, education, climate, crime and justice, whatever sector you look in, there's just this unbelievable problem of making sense of all that scientific information and using it effectively in society. So it sounds like Covenance deals with a lot of large organisations like universities and global research institutions that have a really rigid way of doing things. What was your go-to-market strategy once you'd established your new tool? I guess I should note that right from day one, our go-to-market focus was North America. I think we took the view that the North American market is the most important. So it was that view of it was the must-win market. Like if we win North America, then the rest will follow. If we don't win North America, we will continually be, you know, very constrained, restricted in what we can achieve. You know, for the US, it's got to feel like it's local for Americans. It's got to have a sense of made here, even if it's made elsewhere. You want to develop that kind of US DNA early, I think. How do you go about doing that? In the end, it's about being close to your customers and learning from them. So who are you going to learn from? Like, okay, people are diverse, but there are, there are consistent patterns globally, but there are kind of important cultural differences. So if you're going to, if you're going to learn from anyone, I think in many markets that like, well, learn, learn from the US, understand the US customer, build for the US customer, win the oh, US okay. customer, and then like, will the Canadians tolerate something that feels a little bit American? Yes, in the end. And then the Europeans, yeah, like you can adapt, adapt. I mean, I, I'm probably overemphasizing this, but I just think that there's kind of advantages in going US first. Anyway, so in terms of go to market, so this started as a, as a research project, like within a university environment. And so the first few years, it was essentially just funded through research grants. So we started to build software, use machine learning, et cetera. And, you know, we then made a decision to spin out. Like it was, it was kind of felt like it deserved a life of its own. And so spun out into a nonprofit. And initially it was kind of classic thing. It was free and open to all just to, you know, try and test and understand what users wanted. And then, you know, within a year or so, we were like, okay, we need to, you know, really start thinking through how we can create a revenue stream here. And we started offering a B2C option. And, you know, trying to pick a price point was extremely difficult, of course. And I think at the time we were, we didn't have a lot of capability to make that decision, kind of put it that way. What were you struggling with setting a price? Pricing is, is incredibly difficult. Yeah, I just think that there's a lot you can do to try and understand your market, the value you're, you're creating, and therefore, you know, use different approaches. Obviously, there's like value-based, cost plus, et cetera, et cetera. Once we put that price out, we very, very quickly had organizations coming to us saying, do you have an organizational price? So for us, our key market are academics, essentially. So universities, mostly research institutions, also, you know, government, nonprofits, commercials, et cetera, but the kind of core are, are universities. And, you know, researchers kind of happy to pay for some things, but, you know, when they see a, a productivity tool, Often one of their responses is to essentially go to the university um, and say, hey, you guys should pay for this so that we, the researchers at this university, can access this. And in our world, the bit of the university that researchers tend to approach is the library. So we very quickly had librarians reaching out to, out to us saying, hey, what's your, you know, what's your organizational price? So nice. That's a nice signal from the market. Um, and so, of course, then we had to try and scramble to kind of think, well, what? What would our organizational price be? If you were to do it again, would you still start with a B2C offering or would you start out by targeting the librarians this time? I don't think it really mattered, to be honest, because yeah. I think we we learned very quickly that there was a demand for you know B2B pricing. So I don't think we lost anything going B2C initially. If we move forward to the confidence of today, what does your customer acquisition process look like now? Is it still mainly people approaching you? I think, you know, the classic thing, like word of mouth was incredibly important and powerful early on. So for example, there's a group in our domain in Australia called the Health Librarians of Australia Evidence-Based Practice Group. So you can, you can hear in those words, this is a super, super niche group. <laughs> 
And I was invited to give a talk to them one time. And I was like, you know, like any founder early on in the business, super busy. And it kind of ended up in my diary and I was a bit like, oh my God, I don't know, I really don't want to do this. But then I left it too late and it was too rude to cancel. So I kind of thought, oh, I'll go along. So I went and gave this talk, you know, to this health librarians group in, in Melbourne. And, uh, and as it happens, there were two librarians there from the US, uh, one from Yale and one from, I think, North Carolina, UNC. And they just loved it. They loved Covident. They loved the presentation. So when they went back to the US, they just started talking about Covidence in their email groups, their listservs. Like all of a sudden, we just started getting these like inquiries from like Harvard, Cornell, NYU, Columbia, Berkeley, Stanford. It literally just started happening like that. So we were totally scrambling to kind of make sense and you know, engage with it. It sounds like you were very fortunate. Yeah. And so, of course, what, you know, what, what can you learn from that? I don't know. But it's, it's kind of like you've, you've got to try lots of things and you just it's difficult to predict what thing is going to work. Um, but I think in, certainly in our world, word, word of mouth is just huge. It's still one of the most important go-to-market strategies we have. Are there any strategies you're using to improve the results you're getting from word of mouth? Yeah, yeah, no, no, totally. I mean, I think we do a lot of work to build relationships with, you know, key champions and to kind of nurture those relationships and then look at the ways that we can kind of engage authentically. I think one of the um, advantages we have, to be honest, is that we're a nonprofit and in our world, in that academic world, there's a um, premium put on that. You know, people do really connect with and resonate with a um, public good mission. You've got a bit of tailwind put it that way, with a way you can then engage with those people. So how else has being a nonprofit affected your business and the way you've grown? I think, I, you know, we recognize we're highly unusual to be structured as a, as a nonprofit. So it obviously goes back to, you know, my co-founder and I, we made a very explicit decision when we were spinning out that this whole thing was going to be about impact, not about financial returns either to ourselves or to, to others. You know, that was a very values-based, principle-based kind of decision. It's rock solid. Like, there is absolutely no question that as we continue to work, we are completely and utterly committed to that mission. It has, of course, a number of implications. As a non-profit, I think that, you know, one of the key questions is really around talent. You know, can you attract and retain, you know, great people if you're not offering some form of equity? I must say in the first five years or so, that really kept me awake at night. You know, just aware of, of course, it all always comes back to the people. If you can, if you can get great people, you know, you're in a much better um, position to win, of course. But I think that we began to kind of get a sense that, say, 80% of people are never going to work for us, something like that, because, because we don't offer equity, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that 20 to 30% of people who would potentially be interested in us are very interesting people. It's like a bit of a filter. So I think the people who tend to connect with us and consider working with us have been around a bit. They've got a, I would say, a more sophisticated understanding of themselves and the world and the contributions they're wanting to make, where, of course, the mission and the impact is particularly important. Yeah, and I think that we've proven that we can, there is absolutely no question that we can attract and retain just amazing talent. And I, I, it's, it's really exciting for me, of course, as co-founder, but also it's just great proof point that you that you can do it. You can do it as a nonprofit. I think the other lesson for me out of that is every piece of dogma that you hear in the industry, so it's like Schrodinger's cat. You kind of don't know until you open the box whether it is true or not true. But I, I would take a kind of quantum approach to the way that you ingest and use every piece of dogma out of the industry. Do you think ultimately being a nonprofit has been an advantage or disadvantage when competing with other businesses in your market? I think, I think it's both. So, you know, the other aspect, of course, of being a nonprofit is about the types of capital we can access. So we can't, we can't access equity investments. Uh, we can do grant and debt, and there are some other instruments that we can use, but in general, we can't, we can't use equity investments. And so that does restrict the kind of capital pools that we can access. That is a really important consideration. I, yeah, I would, I would say that we've been quite capital constrained. So I think that's, that's been a challenge. No question. But I think it also has advantages. And so I talked about essentially go-to-market advantages. 
um, you know, we have an incredibly strong relationship with our customers, very strong brand, and our brand is very much about trust and authenticity. And I think that's that's worth an enormous amount in our market, and I would say in any market. Then there's kind of just a broader thing, which is that as a nonprofit, the mission is the mission. Like <laughs> to our very depths of our DNA, in our constitution, everything, it is all about the mission. Whereas I think in, in for-profits, you've got, you know, the, the fiduciary duty of those that are running the company is to maximize financial returns to the shareholders. And so I think you, you can, not always, but you can get a dissonance between the stated mission and that true legal fiduciary responsibility. Yeah, I've definitely felt that before working inside companies where there's a solid tension between the, the stated mission and then the fiduciary responsibility because you know if it really comes to it, fiduciary responsibility wins. And I think, <laughs> again, you know, I think we are essentially a company made up of people who have seen that and who understand just the way that there can be a very um, kind of pernicious effect on a company, that you can be putting a lot of your soul and energy into something because you you kind of resonate deeply with the, with the mission, but you come to this point where you realize, ah, actually, our mission is kind of there, but there's this other thing. And, and of course, sometimes they're in great alignment and it's all wonderful but you know other times those two things start to diverge and then i think it can feel very um you know people feel kind of gutted i think by it particularly if you put a lot of time and energy into a company do you think the clarity of your mission is felt by your customers as well yeah no question no question i think it's what's that phrase like you you know you ship culture so i think it's it's absolutely true you're internal culture is felt by your customers in you know just innumerable intangible ways that you as a founder cannot control there's so many reasons to you know to spend a lot of time thinking about and, and constructing culture but that's one of them looking back is there anything you would have done differently in covidence's journey there's, there's probably too many to go through on this. <laughs> right. no, I, I think um I, um, you know, I ran Covidence essentially as a side business for some time because I was still working as a medical doctor and researcher. And I think it, it took me too long to, to make the step to go kind of full time. You know, there's always, you know, you can always hypothesize around the counterfactuals and, you know, what, what if, et cetera. And it's impossible to know. But I think on balance, it's likely that, you know, it would have been of benefit if I'd kind of committed full time earlier on. At the time, what was stopping you from making the leap? Yeah, many things. I think, you know, stepping into a small company is obviously risky. Also, there's a lot of identity that goes with being a doctor. You know, stepping away from that identity is a, is a big deal. And I think also, I mean, to be honest, I think a lot of it was that I was an HIV physician and in HIV, you develop very long-term relationships with your patients and you've often been through very, very difficult times in their life. And it was very difficult to step away from those relationships. Thanks for coming on today and sharing your expertise and experience with us. Not at all. It's been a pleasure talking with you and uh, good luck on the podcast. Again, thank you so much. So that was Julian Elliott, the founder of Covidence.org. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to learn more about how to grow your SaaS business, you can visit carlanderson.xyz slash SaaS growth and sign up to the newsletter. I'll email you helpful links, articles, and of course, notify you when these podcast episodes come out. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.